Hello you lot, Miller Corner here and welcome back to Secondhand Superheroes, the series that shows you how to get some awesome automotive fun but on a more modest budget than you might expect and today we're talking classics. Some people when they think of classic cars will think of 60s Ferraris and Astons at prestige auctions selling for hundreds of thousands if not millions of pounds and that to get into the world of classics you need to be absolutely loaded. Well today I'm going to show you otherwise with three classics that cost under £3,000 each. So if you fancy a bit of that old world charm, some nicely appreciating values and the opportunity to fit in at a classic car show, you're in luck because today here are three secondhand superhero classic cars. We'll start with one of the most popular classic categories and that is sports cars. My first secondhand superhero today is the Triumph Spitfire, the humble little two-seater from the 60s and 70s which now can be snapped up for under three grand for a good one. These little things I think look brilliant and they're just a little bit less cliched than the far more popular and common MGB. What's more they don't suffer with quite the reliability issues that the MGB did and because because the Spitfire wasn't specifically designed in some cases for the American market, it's a far sweeter handling sports car than that MG is. The Spitfire looks great, makes a nice noise and is a properly nice little fun car to drive around in. However, as with all classics, there are plenty of things to look out for. For a start is rust. The Spitfire is a British classic and that means it's pretty much rusty from the factory. First up is the floors underneath both the carpets, the boot lid inside the lip, the rear of the windscreen pillars, make sure to check behind the rubbers for it as well, and most importantly, the outer sills. There are two separate parts of them that join just ahead of the door curve and they help to hold the structure of the car together. The Spitfire is a separate chassis car, but these outer sills provide a lot of strength. If they're rotten, it's just as easy for the car to split in half. So make sure the one that you're looking at is either absolutely rock solid throughout on both sides of the sills, or there's evidence of it being fully repaired. Head. Also on the bodywork, it's important to check the panel gaps, particularly at the front and the rear of the doors on the Spitfire. Because those sills help to give the car strength, if they're rotten, the whole car will start to gradually bow out and sag, causing uneven panel gaps on the doors. Ultimately, this points to a car which is either starting to bend or already has. Then there's the chrome work. The Spitfire looks fantastic with its selection of chrome bumpers, door handles and the windscreen surround. However, these parts very commonly pit and rust and they're extremely expensive to replace so either negotiate the price of them out of the price of the car or look elsewhere because if you buy one with rusty chrome on it you might well end up spending the value of the car to get it looking good again. There are cardboard side valances ahead of the radiator and they are essential to be there because if they're not there'll be too little air for the radiator which of course will cause the engine to overheat. So look under the bonnet and if there aren't some cardboard valances ahead of the radiator then chances are the car is either on its way to overheating or already has. Also under the bonnet the bottom of the battery tray can rust out as well so it might seem a bit odd on inspection but if you can pull the battery out and make sure the battery tray isn't rotten. Then there's perhaps the most important mechanical issue with the Spitfire. Have someone sit in the car and press the clutch down then watch the crankshaft pulley. If the pulley moves noticeably forward the crankshaft thrust washers may have fallen out into the sump. If they have they're probably already in the car oil mixture and may well have already been sucked up by the engine and if that's the case it's rebuild time because if that engine has sucked up those washers it is toast. Like with a lot of classics the Spitfire's bonnet is most of the front end of the car and lifts up in one massive piece. They're also expensive to replace so check it over thoroughly. Make sure it's straight, it's got all the rubbers in place on both sides to avoid water ingress and there is minimal or no rust and no evidence of any damage repairs. Finally the doors. They should be easy to open but not sag once they're clear of the body as this would point to rusty A pillars. It's fairly common on Spitfires and if it is rusty it's going to be a substantial amount of work and or paid labour hours to set it right. Bear all these things in mind though, make sure you get a good one and the Triumph Spitfire represents a fantastic entry into classic sports car ownership for well under £3,000. If however you don't want to buzz around the back roads and you fancy a bit more of a cruiser then this next one is for you the Mercedes W123 yep that's right the classic Mercedes three box saloon is 
my next secondhand superhero classic. I love the way these things look. They've got a really kind of charming and interesting and characterful look to them. What's more, they have really comfy and really plush interiors. And as we all know, they will go on pretty much forever. W123s are pretty much bomb-proof mechanically, but as with all classic cars, there are things to look out for. W123s are no more immune from rust than any other classic or indeed any other Mercedes, and there are a lot of areas to look out for on these. For a start is the wheel arches. It's common for there to be chrome trims to try and hide it, but if you can, try and look behind or underneath the trims to make sure the arches are solid underneath, because these are quite difficult to repair. Next up are the jacking points. If the jacking points are rusty of course you can't get the car up on a lift to do any work to it so if you can get underneath the car that you're looking at to make sure the jacking points are substantial and solid enough and actually made out of metal next there's the bottom of the doors it's a fairly easy one to check because of course it will pretty much all be on the outer skin which means you can see it but if the doors are rusty you'll be surprised how difficult and expensive it is to replace them finally the rear window frames whether you're going for a saloon an estate or a coupe w123 those rear window frames seem to have particularly thin metal there, so always check to make sure there's not rust hiding under the rubbers. Talking of rubbers, the next thing to bear in mind with these Mercs are the door seals. They get particularly thin at the top and they get brittle and hard with age, which means they let water in, which will of course ruin the interior and potentially rot it out in the long run. The good news is replacing those rubbers is very easy. There are specialists all over the country. In short, if the car you're looking at does appear to have some water ingress inside do be prepared to do some interior refurbing but if it's all good then put some brand new door seals in and you'll be surprised how easy it is to do so we know that old mercs can click on for hundreds of thousands of miles but that doesn't stop some of them trying to hide it the odometers on old 70s and 80s mercs are fairly common to just stop spinning one day keep an eye on the odometer during the test drive and make sure that it moves along at a realistic pace some of them move too slowly some of them might have stopped altogether but equally it's not unknown for some of them to move too quickly. A broken odometer isn't the most expensive or difficult item to repair or replace but if you want the lowest mileage classic possible then make sure the one on the car you're looking at is original and fully functioning. Mechanically W123s are solid as a rock but there are a couple of things to look out for. They run off of a fairly complex and quite extensive vacuum system used to operate all number of features in the car including the window Make sure under the bonnet that all the vacuum lines are soft, well sealed and that all the vacuum operated equipment works properly. The original lines are probably going to be coming up for 35, maybe 40 years old now. So of course it is acceptable that some of them will have gone brittle and maybe split causing certain items to not work. Again they're not expensive items to repair or replace but make sure that it is just vacuum lines causing things to not work. The Mercedes W123 is a fantastic budget class. Classic. They're cheap at around £2,500 for a decent one, they're extremely reliable, comfortable and they're very much daily drivable. What's more they're just different enough that you don't see them very often unlike some other classics. So if you want something relaxing and easy to live with the W123 is the classic for you. The final second hand superhero classic is me throwing a bit of a curveball but if you're veterans to this channel you won't be surprised by my final choice and that is the Fiat 126. These quirky little beasts are plentiful in Europe. As I saw when I went to Poland, because the 126 was made over there, they still absolutely love to maintain these things and even modify them to make them look even more quirky and brilliant. Johnny Smith, aka Car Pervert, called the 126 the perfect starter classic, and I'm inclined to agree with him there. However, as with all classics, there are things to bear in mind, and we're going to start with the big one it's rust, and 126s unfortunately unfortunately do have a lot of problem areas for it. For a start there's the sills. On the Polish made 126P models the sills are under sealed followed by a single layer of paint over them. Unfortunately it's not uncommon for water to get in between the two and rot the sills from the inside out. So when you go to look at a 126 as with all classics take a magnet with you and attempt to stick it thoroughly all over the known rust spot inside 
and out if you can to make sure that the one you're looking at isn't hiding any nasty surprises. Just behind the front arches is another commonly known rust spot for 126s, so pull back all the carpets and again have your magnet handy to make sure that the floors are as solid as they should be. The rear quarter panels are a particular weak spot. What with the 126 being rear engined, some heat given off from the engine can cause the paint to blister and of course ultimately for rust to be on set and this is a particularly difficult and expensive thing to replace or repair so make sure that your rear quarters are as solid as possible. The spare wheel well which is located in the front of the car on account of it being rear engine is another known rust spot so again check thoroughly make sure it's solid. The bottom of the doors in 126s are known to rust out but again it should be fairly visible. Also they're not particularly expensive to replace but 126 parts aren't that common in the UK so try and source some good doors before you go and buy a car with rusty ones. Under and around the front and rear windscreens can also rust on 126s. Check them thoroughly and pull back the rubbers. Make sure the shell is as solid as possible because these are particularly troublesome areas to repair. If you're buying a 126 with one of the earlier air-cooled engines, it's known for oil to leak at the bottom of the cylinder barrels and the pushrod tubes. Oil dripping from the bell housing equals a leaking rear crankshaft oil seal. It's not the end of the world and it's certainly not expensive or difficult to repair but it will likely involve dropping the engine. Again it's not difficult to do but be prepared for such an eventuality. 126s have no synchros in first gear much like a lot of old cars so if you're on a test drive do not attempt to engage first gear while you're moving. If you do that might be enough to lunch the gearbox altogether. On the 126 biz models which are the water cool ones it's commonly known that they blow a head gasket due to a lack of cooling system maintenance. The thermostat is right at the bottom of the engine and it's fairly common for it to collect dirt from being near to the road and then to stick. Make sure the thermostat is working properly and that the fan comes in to keep that water cooled engine cool. But if you can avoid all these problems and buy a good one, what you've got in the 126 is a quirky, fun and extremely unusual classic that you definitely won't see every day or even every classic car show for around £2,000. If however you can't find the right one for you in the UK, then as I pointed out in Poland, the supplies over there are cheap and plentiful, so why not go over there, buy one, and hell, stick it in the back of a van and bring it back that way. So there you have it, three unusual and affordable classic cars that means you'll stand out from the crowd and get to sample a bit of days gone by without having to blow millions on classic supercars. I can recommend any of these as a starter classic, and if space and money allowed, I think I would own all three of them. So what car do you want to see some secondhand superhero alternatives to next? What car or type of car are you lusting after but you just can't stretch to financially? Let me know in the comments below because I want to give you the same experience as your dream car but for a much more affordable price. Thanks so much for watching the video everybody. I really really appreciate it. If you liked it don't forget to give it a big old thumbs up and also subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you are notified when a new Miller Corner video is released. But for now, thanks once again for watching everybody and have a brilliant rest of your day. See you soon and have a good one.